with the iPhone? Yep. Do you like the quality? It's really yeah. cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I never yeah. use it for actual radio. I used purposes, to use it before. So. For radio. Yep. Yeah. Okay, if you could just start by telling me your name and what you do. My name is Larry McCauley. Um, I'm the founder of Refugee Radio Network, a media platform for refugees by refugees in Hamburg, Germany. And how did you come to start this? Why, what was the motivation? The motivation was the negative narrative in mainstream media. And um, as a refugee myself, with my peer, we decided to have our own alternative voice, independent of what they say on the media, so that we can start educating the wider community that we're hosted in. Can you give me some examples of the negative media that you observed and that you felt unsettled by? Ah, they call us, they still call us rapists, terrorists. I mean, they don't, they don't single out individual cases. All refugees are dangerous people. They are all terrorists, they are all mercenaries. They said that physically, politicians. You have members of the UK party in the UK who say a lot of things against migrants and foreigners. So those are the things that we decided to take the horn and change it by ourselves. And can you give me some examples of the sort of narratives that you're providing that don't exist in the, in the mainstream media? Well, what we provide is basically our own story on diluted and cut. I mean, we use theatre as a medium to reach out and we decided to put that into audio recordings and present it on the show, on the radio. So it tells our real story in a theatrical form. And people who don't have time to come to all these events that are hosted in community halls and things, they could listen alternatively in their kitchen rooms, you know. People who don't come to protest grounds when we have demos can listen to what happened at the demo because we do record all those events. So that's the alternative that I'm talking about. So give me some examples of the sorts of voices of refugees that have come through in your radio. Oh, we've done quite a while, a few. Um, uh, we spoke with Sister Jamila, an Eritrean lady here in Italy who was having a tough time after being given papers. There's no job, there's no house. She had psychological breakdown. We were able to meet with her. I spoke, I did interviews with a newly arrived Gambian boy that arrived into my hands in, in Sicilia in 2014 when I was on, on tour. And uh, I continued to connect with him. And um to check on his progress and um, he narrated his story. We did an interview with him almost an hour directly over uh, Skype from a migrant center and he gave us on straight out what was happening there. They were in protest, they were protesting for documents and things like that. So we've done also, I've been uh, at the receiving end of receiving migrants who were disembarking from a Medicine San Frontier boat in, in Calabria last year. And um, I've gone to camps in Italy, in Germany, Hamburg, Berlin, wherever we can find refugee groups. Uh, we are also the Afghan Voices, the Afghan group, newly arrived refugees, walked up to me and said they wanted their own voice. Why do you want your voices? Because a lot of things are happening in the refugee camps that people don't know, and we want the people of Hamburg to know about it. Can you give me some examples of that? Uh, you mean what happens in refugee camps? Uh, the discrimination amongst refugee groups, uh, hated by government. Uh, we all know today Syrian refugees are the golden child of refugee situation, and how they discriminate along edu. You know, people don't even have. If you have an Afghan today or an African, you don't have access to education now. You must be either a Syrian. Those are the kinds of discrimination we're talking about. So do you try and collate this evidence as a way to uh, challenge it? Yes, um, because like when we had an interview with the Sudanese brother that was picked up, I, I, call it, I call it kidnapping in broad daylight. It was picked up, no charges were made. They put him in detention. After eight months, they let him go. They couldn't deport him. So that's broad daylight kidnapping. And um, he told his story. I didn't hear that story uh, on any media platform. So that story comes out from our own platform, and we've always been using it as an educational tool also when we do workshops with refugee groups all over the place. That This is what is happening. And are people receptive? I mean, have you found the mainstream media picking up any of your stories? Yeah, we've done quite a lot of interviews with mainstream media who came knocking on our door later on, and many of them do pick up on 
on audio files that we have that we share with them they ask i say go go to the web platform take anything you like do they pay you no it's open it's free source <laughs> it's open there is an issue here, isn't there, about the mainstream media not reporting accurately, in your mm -hmm, view, mm -hmm. and having the resources, whereas an organisation like yours, which is largely self-funded mm -hmm. and very poorly resourced, mm -hmm. uh, providing the stories that they should be covering. Do you feel that as a challenge? Knowing what the mainstream media represent, they represent government, in my own opinion. and That they would challenge that. Most public service broadcasters do not feel that they're a voice uh, for government. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of them came together and just came up with a story in January that um, 1,000 refugees raped women in, her in, in Cologne and picked it up in Denmark, in Sweden. They were reporting similar cases. I was in Hamburg, they were reporting these cases, and I was in St. Pauli, in Ripaban, I didn't see anything. So, that so you're challenging the accuracy of those yes, reports? Yes, they have never been accurate. I was in Libya. On Al Jazeera, they were saying Medina is, uh, has been occupied by opposition. And I was in Medina, we came out, it, th there was nothing happening in Medina. So those are the kinds of things. Do you think that because of your own background and experience as a refugee, people tell you things that they wouldn't tell to mainstream media? Yes, because we do not approach them as reporters or as journalists. We approach each other as fellow refugees and brothers and sisters. So we sit down first. We don't bring out equipments. He knows the my partner knows, colleague knows the approach. And um, we first of all share stories. We counsel each other. And then from there on, I ask them, this is very important that you share this story with the wider world. OK, let me do it. And they do. Do you think that there is a, any issue about um, you know, as a journalist, you're trained to be sceptical, to always test evidence, to always try and make sure that people are reporting facts Accurately, rather than... Yeah. So, do you think there's ever a challenge for you that you're, because you're in the sharing mode, you may not be necessarily always getting an accurate representation? Sorry. Um, for me, as a refugee that has gone through it, I know when a refugee is lying. Definitely. And I just tell him, good story nollywood movie let's move on you know i know uh, and, and a lot of my colleagues know that and i know the true story and i do work with, i do consulting for a lot of um, people who work with refugee groups in medical psychology or whatever so those are the things we evaluate together they come to me and say well mm, the storyline looks cool but in in what from what i know it's not true dig in deep, look for these questions and things like that. I do give them such um, advice. And they do dig in and they do find out that, yeah, I was right. So. Just tell me a bit more about the model that you're using for community radio. How does it work? How do you include so many different languages and experiences? To be frank with you, there's no model. It's just a matter of being, you know, community itself. Growing up in Nigeria, in the village, there are different people, different clan in a village, and we get along al uh, along certain lines. So that's the same approach. You shouldn't. I used to watch Bollywood movies when I was young. I never understood the uh, Indian language, even Chinese movies, and we understood the storyline, and we learned some words even in Indian, in Indian and Chinese. So what uh, what what's changed? So you're saying that if you have a sort of open approach, you can actually make understanding yeah. happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of people... I, I was at a place, event... I just played an Afghan documentary that I got on Voice of America. An Afghan group walked to me. They just heard Dari language, and they were like, wow, where did I get that? Did I do the report? Now I now have to tell them it's not my report, but it's a documentary by The Voice of America and so on and so forth. And from there on, I want to do Radio DJ. I want to do this. So I have to encourage them because they are in, a lim they are in limbo in a refugee camp. They end up their endless waiting period, one, sometimes two years. I spent two and a half, three years almost in a migrant center. So... It's an empty space. The only thing they tell you to do if it's there, it's go learn the language, introductory course to speaking basic language, and that doesn't really help anything. And do you think the medium of radio is particularly powerful? Is it, it is. It is one of the most powerful tools 
growing up in Africa in a community where in communities where radio is very powerful in educating and empowering people of different uh, groups. That's why we introduced the radio as a tool to empower the refugees to do creative stuff. We have refugees who sing now, who produce their own music, and we play it on air free for them. So that's how, and we are we encourage refugees to do artistic projects. If you are a painter, paint. If you are a tailor, sew cloth. There's no law that says you shouldn't sew in your house. The only law is the restriction is don't go and rent a shop and you don't have the adequate license. So if you know you know how to make shoes, make it in your room, bring it to open projects and exhibit it. You never know who's going to pick it up. If you're a footballer, play football. If you're a sports person, do the same. So that's the same approach. I'm sorry. Whenever you're ready, I've got Okay. Uh, can I just ask yeah. one last thing? What single thing would help secure the future of, of this project that you've embarked on? Well, sincerity and funding. Tell me what you mean by the film. Sincerity means don't create phantom stories. Don't use the project for your own selfish gains, which I um, transparency is there for me. And the uh, second part is funding. We need him. We need money to move. We don't report in our live in our living rooms. You must go find the story, and that's it. Because when uh, when I walk up to them in a refugee center in Calabria, with refugee radio coming all the way from Hamburg, it's something. So you need resources to do the journey. To do it, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, I wanted <laughs> to ask some more questions about the station itself, and one of the things I'm wondering is, so where you physically have the, the radio station, is it a place where people gather? Yes, um, we, we, Refugee Radio Awareness Network is like a social club, and they are the owners of Refugee Radio Net Project, which is the Refugee Radio Network. So we, uh, we congregate as a club, as a social group of people, different refugees, we drink tea, we chat. Then we have a radio project that we do and a TV project inclusive now. So that's the idea. Because it seems like that is a really po important part of it for the volunteers, right? Having a space to kind of come together. There are spaces to do that in Hamburg. That's why for us, Hamburg is one of the few cities that I've been to in, in, the, in the whole of Europe that affords us that uh, opportunity. For instance, FSK is a free radio. They were the first to support us, and we use them as a platform to do all our work. It's a free radio, community radio station in Hamburg. It's, a, it's on the left, of course. And then they do things. In Hamburg, they have a tradition of doing things in community groups. So there's, the facilities are there. We have a project we're running with um, a theater company, a theater fabric in Hamburg call, uh, called Camp Nagel. It's one of the biggest theater uh, fabric. And we have this project we organize together. We call it the Migrant Politans. So it's migrant and metropolitan together. We mixed it mm -hmm. together. And it's a space, they gave us a space to do creative work. So we have the Refugee Awareness Day there. We do workshops. We do a lot of things. We have the Women's Day. They have the Queer, queer Day. So a lot of activities going on in the Migrant Politan. And we got funding for them. Camp Nagel got funding for it. And um, we've extended it till the end of the year. So that's the progress that we're talking of. So there are adequate space to do this. The first international conference of migrants and refugees took place in Camp Nagel organized by refugees and migrants. And it pulled in the largest crowd in the history of that city, self-organized. So the idea that refugees and migrants cannot do things by themselves, it's phantom. So we've been able to bro break that barrier now. People came from all over Europe, even from the United Kingdom, Scotland, and France, and everywhere. So give the rep refugees empower them with opportunities to compete and see if they will contribute, they will impact on the society. And I know they will impact. We saw what the Indians do in the, in, in the United Kingdom with their business, with their trading and everything. I mean, they're paying tax, they're law-abiding citizens. Why can't we do the same? So how do you get all these different voices on the radio? Because obviously not everybody can come to the station, to Hamburg, and then what are the they different call. ways? They call by telephone, by Skype, mm, they text us, we book, we, organize, we arrange an interview session over the internet. 
That's basically how it is. Sometimes we get in invitations to come and help them. If it suits, if we have the budget to do that, we do. And do you think, have you seeded other projects, like people that have heard about what you've done and are doing things in their own communities? Yeah, we've, we've, we've helped two or three projects like that in Germany as a whole, in the south, in Munich. I went to Munich because it was, Bavaria is an hotspot of racial intolerance in Germany. And when they called me, when the BR called me last year, BR is the biggest uh, media house in the south Germany. When they called me and I said, okay, Bavaria is a hot spot, we have to do something there. And we set up the refugee radio project there too, with them, in partnership with them. So that's the way I cooperate with people who want to do meaningful things. We have a lot of people who want to use refugee projects as PR stunts for their media houses. We know there's a lot of them now doing that. Getting back to the to the to the beginnings, mm -hmm. how much equipment did you start with when you first started no, the radio station? Cheap because I got I just raised I think all of us, me, Sami, and Asuko, we, we, we were able to come up with eight to 1,000 euros. And we just went shopping for cheap, basic equipment, recorders, zooms that are much more worse than this one. <laughs> so, and that was all we were using for like seven, eight months. Then we, uh, we got funding a little bit, we upgrade. When we get a little money, after our expenses we have leftovers, we buy something like this which is much more, you know, so that's the way. One of the other things I um, wanted to make sure I understood, so the way that you're on FM now mm -hmm. is through these other partnerships, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Like with the station you were just talking about yes. in Hamburg? Yeah, we have FS got two stations in Hamburg, three in Berlin, one in Marburg, which is close in the center, one in, two in Munich area, in Bavaria area, and um, Frankfurt, no, no, Stuttgart, yeah, and uh, there's the seven in total. And do you produce a separate kind of two-hour uh, program or something? We produce a magazine, weekly magazine program that we do. We call it the Refugee Voices Show. It's a magazine program where we talk freestyle, music, everybody contributes. It's fun. You hear stories, interviews that we bring from all over the place. And anybody can listen to it online? Anybody. It's there. The Listen on Demand files are there on SoundCloud, MixCloud, and everything. So it's, uh, can you just, for our listeners, just identify how they'd find your Well, audio. it's very easy. Just go to www.refugeeradionetwork.net, one word, no space. Then you go to Listen on Demand, click, and you find audio. If it's the TV, you f just click TV, and you find TV. And you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on G+, and you can engage with us, write us, chat with us, and you never know, we might read your message on, on a live. Radio is a powerful tool. How many volunteers? You asked how many volunteers we have. We started with three refugees. We expanded to five. Two females came in. And um, then three other guys came in from different backgrounds, nationality. Now we are like in 14. And we have volunteering partners, Europeans, Germans, everywhere all over the world. So it depends on if you have something to share with us along that line. And, you know, after the fledgling bubble of last summer, a lot of refugee initiatives sprang up on Facebook. So we all like, it's a community, we all talk, chat, you know, in chat rooms, and that's the way. And she asked about who are the people who listening. The, yeah, do you know who, who is listening to you, apart from refugees and maybe the people who are involved with the issues you are dealing like, with? Like I said, we have a studio that we use in all the cities. I could decide to, of course it's Hamburg based, but I could decide to run, to have a live show in Berlin today. I just walk into Alex Berlin and use my slot to run a live show. And there's a telephone line in, people call in. And who calls? Germans sometimes, uh, refugees sometimes, migrants sometimes, different people, even from outside of Germany. We and hear. what the German people uh, are saying when they call? Some applaud, yeah, we like what you are doing, keep it up, encouraging us. Some don't like us, hate mails, negative. You want to come, you know, when I use the word, let's teach the community. They are hungry about that. They don't understand that I'm using it metaphorically, that it's teach me, I teach you. That's just how simple it is. So some people write, you want to, you monkey, you want to come and teach us. You don't have a filter of the telephone calls. 
you know, we can filter that. Our kind of studio is not the main, like Rai or BBC, where there's an engineer who can. No, it's you do everything on your own. They teach you a crash course. This is how you move it up. Microphone, everything is on. Telephone, punch it, talk. So if we, we so we just have to use our own intelligence. Okay, we thank you for calling, and we continue our discussion. These are the negative ones. Let's move on. And is your like the the the, the future you know um, steps of your work mm. are connected with a public broadcaster, or what is your objective? Like, what do you for me? What do you, what is your dream? Like to communicate to a community or to communicate to a nation? I've done a lot of public broadcaster. Go, go to the website and see all the media hype. BBC, no, BBC, no. We've done Dutch Vela, we've done German Public Radio, we've done, done Radio Vatican twice, Radio France, uh, Spanish, mm, FR. So there's a lot of news hype that we've done report. That's as a result to get out so that people know. And most of these programs are community-driven programs on this mainstream media platform. I did El Mondo with your with Rai Trem. So that's the way we reach out to with to mainstream. Having a radio show on mainstream media, well, it's a welcome development, but I'm not putting my hopes on that because but not a radio show on a mainstream media, mm -hmm. radio like a you know national radio station for instance that's a big dream with all the cost involved that's a, that's a dream i don't want to dream we can't even get funding for ordinary refugee radio online platform you are, you are taking me far as dreaming to have uh, but what difference do you think uh, it, it may you you made in this uh, couple of years you are like what that's is why i said i rely on alternative media around social media, Facebook, all this. That's the future. FM is going. Of course, DAB is here now. Satellite is here. So, and we are on those platforms with all these FM stations that are switched. So for me, getting to the people who don't want to listen to mainstream anymore is very important. A lot of people are switching off their TV now because it's always bomb, bomb, bomb. They, they are dangerous. They are, so people don't want to listen to that. They're looking for something different. And that's why you see some most of these media houses are also going Facebook now. BBC is on Facebook. All of them are there now because that's the future. So why don't we harness what we have now, which is this online thing? Can I ask a different question? Um, what would you say the greatest information needs are of the refugees that are calling in or participating? They need the real information, not the pamphlet procedure information of, yes, if you get to Europe, you ask for asylum, blah, blah. These procedures, administrative people don't follow it anyway. So they need information of, listen, my brothers, you're welcome to Europe. This is what Europe really is. I am a refugee, I'm a migrant, and I'm telling you from that perspective, you have to tie your trousers very well, and it's a battleground here. Be creative. Use your personal creativity. Learn. If you want to learn, it's free for you to do so. That's the kind of things we tell them, not phantom. So, so much of it is people there's, sharing out there. There's no people. job for you here, so you better start thinking of what you will create to, you know, self-reliance. That's the kind of thing that I tell them. And that's what we focus on. We don't tell them news. BBC and all of them, right, they do that. What is your status right now? On uh, my document? No document. Are you refugee? What is your? Yeah, I'm a political. I'm an international protected person. So I have political asylum status. It's almost expiring now. It's five years. I, I got it in 2012. So, so it's, ex it's going to expire next year. So, so that's my status. Did you ever imagine you'd be doing this when you were back in Nigeria? Yeah, because I've always dreamt of doing radio radio especially because I loved radio so much and that's why you see my report I always say I'm a radio junkie tell me about your father's listening oh well my dad huh, he listens to BBC that sound you know that intro sound of BBC this well this is London London that old one and I remember the voice of Alistair Cook that smooth reading voice of letters from America 
So those things really, really, one, BBC played a huge part, VOA also. And then later on, I started listening to other radio stations, Dutch Avela, Radio France International. And that's the interest. And I listened to a lot of FM, local, everything, even Indian stations. <laughs> so anything that appeals to me. When I was in Italy, I used to listen to Rai a lot. But I don't know which one, but I, there's one particular one that I like, the way that it, you know, the audio quality comes out, so I like it. So that's my... Was it a music program or a news? It was, I think, one of the Rai news program because they talk a lot of uh, politics a lot in, in it. So for me, that's, that's it. And I listen to RTL, FM, this radio, this satellite thing. So. Fabulous. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for having me.